Our theme today are the developing countries and especially the large developing countries. And the existence of alternative trajectories of development in the world. I begin with a Brazilian prologue. And the second foundation of this growth strategy was the production and export of commodities. Uh, Brazil deindustrialized, as many contemporary economies have. Agriculture, ranching, and mining paid the bill of urban consumption. This strategy of economic development prospered so long as commodity prices were on high. And then it began to collapse when commodity prices fell. In this period, China became our main market, replacing the United States. We began to export to China the relatively untransformed products of nature and to receive from China almost everything in return, or everything that had been touched by, by the human intellect. Um, uh, when this strategy began to fail as a result of the decline of commodity prices, the then government attempted to uh, maintain the, the afterlife of this development strategy by resorting to a series of fiscal devices, of public spending, of subsidies, of what we could call broadly vulgar Keynesianism. Uh, this recourse uh, worked for a while, uh, but uh, then made everything worse by helping to disorganize public finance. Then the, the then government, the then president, was removed from office, and a new group of people came to power with the ideas of the uh, 80s and 90s of the past century, uh, namely to do everything that the financial markets and the political, economic, and academic authorities of the North Atlantic countries recommended. So this was the doctrine of seeking financial confidence as a basis of economic growth. And of course, it has not worked or worked only barely. Uh, and thus, we come to our present stance in which the country must radically reorient its development strategy by finding a way to change the economy on the supply side, by qualifying and democratizing the economic order on the supply side with respect to economic opportunities and educational capabilities. There is a fundamental difference between democratizing the economy on the demand side and democratizing it on the supply side. The democratization of the economy on the demand side can be done just with money, uh, and especially money financed by the easy resources of nature. Uh, 
But the democratization of the economy on the supply side requires institutional change. And institutional change in turn requires ideas. And ideas are always the most scarce resource. Now a few words about the background to this situation. Because the background is even more illustrative than the story itself. One component of the background has to do with the idiom of Brazilian politics, a variant of the kind of politics that exists all around the world, and especially in democracies in the context of developing economies. There are many political parties in Brazil, but at least until very recently, there has been only one idea. And this idea could be called tropical Sweden. So uh, almost all the Brazilian politicians profess to be social democrats or social liberals. Uh, what is the meaning of this term social? The social is the sugar. And the main activity in politics is to sugarcoat the bitter pill of economic necessity. Uh, so, at tropical Sweden, in this sense, that the most admired model is the model of the Scandinavian social democracies, misunderstood, fantasized. So, what's seen is the epilogue, the epilogue of the Scandinavian welfare state of Scandinavian social democracy. What is not seen is the pre-existing narrative, many decades in Sweden, of struggle between the state and the dynastic plutocracies that have owned much of the Swedish economy, ending in a kind of compromise in which the state expropriated some of their power under a variety of legal devices, but maintained them in the effective ownership of much of the productive system. So the Brazilians, like much of the world, would like the epilogue without having to suffer the trials and tribulations of the preceding narrative. Uh, that's what I mean by uh, tropical Sweden. Now, uh, the politicians on the whole misunderstand the wishes of the Brazilian people. The Brazilian people accept sugar if there's nothing else, but sugar is not what they most want. What, what they most want are, is uh, equipment and opportunities, and that's what they don't get from the present course of Brazilian politics, with its pre-existing focus on the democratization of the demand side rather than of the supply side. Now, second, the social background. The most momentous transformation in the country in recent decades is analogous to changes that have happened in many other parts of the world. There was in Brazil a traditional middle class uh, oriented to the liberal professions and to public employment and with a horizon of European culture. But the significant social change of recent decades is the emergence of a second mestizo dark-skinned middle class of millions of people who come from the bottom and who uh, struggle to open and maintain small businesses, who uh, study at night, who join new churches and new associations, and who inaugurate in the country a culture of initiative and self-help. This uh, entrepreneurial petty bourgeoisie is simply the front line of a broader movement. Behind them are millions of workers who are still poor, but some of whom hold two or three jobs, and who have already assimilated, despite their poverty, this culture of self-help and initiative. And the eyes of the Brazilian people are turned to this vanguard of what we call the emergent. Uh, and this group is uh, bereft of a political project. It disbelieves in politics. It is repelled by the politicians and the political parties. Uh, and it has no 
political vehicle. It is the crucial political agent in national life, and its direction will be decisive for the future of the country. Now, a third component of the background is the constitutional background. Uh, so it's a variant of what generally happens in third world or developing country democracies. Uh, Brazil, like much of Latin America, has imported the American-style presidential regime and American-style federalism. So there is a directly elected president who is elected to office, often promising the sky to the masses, uh, with a strong popular mandate. But coming to power, he finds himself in a constitutional architecture designed by James Madison and his contemporaries to inhibit the political transformation of society. So that's the essence of the Madisonian scheme in the American constitutional architecture. There's a liberal principle of the fragmentation of power, and there's a conservative principle of the slowing down of politics. The broader the reach of a transformative project, the more severe the range of the constitutional obstacles to its execution, not by accident, but by design. The Americans believe mistakenly that there is a natural and necessary relation between the liberal principle and the conservative principle. In fact, they're, they are related not by necessity or by reason, but by design, because it was the purpose of the framers to make it difficult to transform through politics the economic regime of society. Uh, as a result, the tendency in these democracies, in which there's a president with a plebiscitarian mandate, but a constitutional arrangement designed to inhibit the transformative use of politics, is that politics tends to veer between stasis and Caesarism. Either there is the blockade, which is created by the constitutional arrangements, <coughs> or there is the attempt of the president with his plebiscitarian mandate to appeal directly to the masses in an attempt to overwhelm the constitutional arrangements. Now we come to a fourth part of the background, and the fourth part of the background is intellectual or spiritual. The intellectual situation, the, the state of ideas, is, is on the whole uh, a deficient in conceptions that could inform projects of structural change. There are two main currents in the life of the intelligentsia. One current is a shrunken and embarrassed Marxism. So it has cut Marxism in half. It has discarded the good part, the transformative aspirations, and kept the bad part, the historical fatalism. Uh, and the other main current in intellectual life uh, is the imitation of American-style social science and policy discourse, beginning with economics, uh, deployed as a kind of right-wing Hegelianism, uh, uh, a justification of the rationality of the dominance of the dominant arrangements. So these two currents seem to be opposed to each other, but de facto they converge in a kind of pastiche, which is the lingua franca of the intelligentsia, denying the country the ideas with which to imagine transformative alternatives. So a climate of mental colonialism hangs over the context of national alternatives. And the mental colonialism is not just some intangible entity, but is incarnate in the experience of individuals. So I'll give you an example, which is very telling. Uh, for many years, uh, for, for decades, I've observed here at, at, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, the uh, arrival of middle-class Brazilian students 
who were admitted to the doctorate in economics at Harvard or MIT. And so these are people who are very clever, who have been very good at text, who have pleased their elders and teachers. Uh, and they uh, then come with the intention, with the announced intention, of writing a thesis that will resist and help reorient so-called neoliberal economics, by which they mean the economics that began at the end of the 19th century with the marginalist transformation of economics. So they come here with this, with this purpose. Uh, and their teachers, the professors, the economics professors at Harvard and MIT, don't forbid them from carrying out this project, but are unable to help them. The, the professors have no idea what these people are talking about. And, and uh, are, are unable to come to their, to their assistance. And then what happens to these young Brazilians is that they're unable to do what they set out to do. Nothing in the intellectual life of the country equips them with the intellectual instruments necessary to the prosecution of this campaign. And they don't know enough of, of the history of philosophy or of social theory or of economics itself or the history of, ec of the economy. They, have, they lack the equipment. And the professors are unable to furnish them with this equipment. So then they, ex they have an experience of, of failure. They can't do what they came to do. And they end up doing the opposite of what they came to do. They end up writing a thesis applying the dominant analytic apparatus to some aspect of local Brazilian experience. For example, the Brazilian hyperinflation. The, the exact inverse of what they set out to do. And this is a, a calamity for them. So they, they have this experience of intimate failure. And then they think, well, we couldn't be what we wanted to be. At least when we go back to Brazil, we won't be poor. But a country where the middle class is precarious, to be middle class is to be nothing. So then they think they'll go, for example, they'll begin by working at the central bank, then they'll jump to private finance, and they'll become rich. Their perversion was described by Rousseau in the Emile uh, when he wrote, they could not become men, so they decided to become rich. Uh, and uh, the, the, the existential tragedy is entangled in, in, the, in the national tragedy because these people then went on to write the economic plans that have decisively shaped the experience of the country in recent decades. They are regarded in Brazil as geniuses. Uh, in their own eyes, they are failures. Uh, as the scales of divine justice are foreshadowed in the remorselessness with which we judge ourselves. Uh, now that's my little Brazilian fable. Uh, and now, uh, with that fable in mind, uh, I, uh, I, uh, I turn to the broader discussion of the, the alternative trajectory of the developing countries. And especially the large developing countries, the middle income continental developing countries. So I make some initial remarks. So the first remark is that the widely professed goal of socially inclusive economic growth uh, can be implemented only by innovations in the institutional arrangements of the market and of democracy. So for over 200 years, the main model of ideological controversy in the world has been a kind of hydraulic model. The state against the market. More state, less market. More market, less state. Some compromise between state and market 
that would be social liberalism or social democracy. But uh, what is required, according to this argument that I'm about to outline, is not some striking of a balance between the state and the market, but rather some institutional transformation in the character of both the market and the state. So from that standpoint, the institutional forms of the market economy, of independent civil society, and of democratic politics that are now established in the rich North Atlantic world are a subset of a much broader range of institutional possibilities. And our hopes of, which was not on, and our hopes Oh no, that's that's yours. And and our hopes of progress, yes, our hopes of progress depend on moving outside this subset, the subset established in the rich North Atlantic world. Now, my second observation is that the most promising seat for this deviation, this innovation in the institutional arrangements of the market and democracy may lie in these large middle-income developing countries like China or Brazil because they have the practical and spiritual resources, the dimension with which to imagine themselves as different worlds capable of rebellion as opposed to the much more limited circumstance of a small, very open economy. Uh, but their potential for fertile heresy is annulled by what I earlier called mental colonialism. So in these great countries, the, the ability to deviate is to some extent uh, struck down, counteracted, uh, by intellectual prostration. It's impossible to deviate without ideas and without going beyond the constraints imposed by this mixture of the shrunken Marxism <coughs> and the second-hand American social science and policy discourse, both of which are characterized by their deficiency of institutional imagination. Now, my third preliminary remark <coughs> is that despite the radical differences among these developing countries, even among the large developing countries, some, for example, rich in natural resources, others not, some with uh, cultural traditions that are oriented to education, others not, and so forth, despite all of those differences, there is a remarkable similarity of the uh, imperatives that must be met to give practical substance to the goal of socially inclusive economic growth. And we might ask ourselves, why is there this similarity despite the differences of the countries? Uh, one explanation is that on the one hand, in all of these countries, whether they are democracies or not, political legitimacy depends on some degree of wide sharing in the benefits of economic growth. On the other hand, in the world today, there is a very restricted repertory of live options for the organization of different domains of social life the organization of the market economy, the organization of the state, the relation of the state to the family, and so forth. Uh, and this restricted repertory is, in a sense, the fate of the contemporary societies. So the point of departure is given, on the one hand, by the powerful goal of making some progress toward the end of social, socially inclusive economic growth, and on the other hand, by this very limited repertory of available options for the organization of different parts of society, which are then the starting points 
of these efforts and innovation. Now, with these three preliminary remarks in mind, I then suggest seven main elements in an alternative direction that would be commonly shared among many of these large developing countries. A direction, again, designed to give substance to the goal of socially inclusive economic growth. The first element is the need for a fiscal shield of national rebellion. The government has to have a buffer, a protection, so that it is not on its knees dependent on the confidence of the domestic and the global financial markets. This shield, in turn, has three components. So one component is a high level of national safety, both private and public. Keynesianism has taught us that the level of saving is more the consequence than the cause of economic growth. But this theoretical thesis fails to recognize the strategic significance of a high level of saving at the outset of a process of rebellious national development so that the government can defy the imperative of financial confidence and do what it regards as necessary. Uh, the second element in this fiscal shield of national rebellion is a high tax take. <coughs> a high tax take which is one of the preconditions of a high level of national saving, of high public saving, as well as of the, the, the potential for a high level of public investment. Now, in the short term, the only way to sustain a high tax take, compatibly with accelerated capital formation and economic growth, is to rely very heavily on the regressive and indirect taxation of consumption. And then to compensate for the regressive character of this style of taxation by the consequences of public investment. So what is lost by progressivity on the revenue raising side would be gained or gained in double on the spending side by the redistributive character of public investment. Uh, and the third component of this fiscal shield is a very high level of of reserves in hard currency and foreign currency, which may appear to be economically irrational in the short term because they're very expensive to develop and maintain, but that may be necessary strategically, at least in the early stages of this process of national rebellion. So let me call that the first element, this fiscal shield of national rebellion. And the fiscal shield of national rebellion trumps the attractions of Keynesian counter-cyclical management of the economy. So uh, we know, and I commented in an earlier class, that when the progressives in the world lost faith in the statist direction of the economy and in Marxism, they often sought refuge in vulgar Keynesianism. But vulgar Keynesianism is fatal uh, to the maintenance of this uh, margin of maneuver of the state in its, in its ability to initiate a rebellious strategy of national development. Uh, now comes the, the second element in this uh, broadly pertinent uh, program of, uh, of development in the circumstances of the large developing countries. The second element is caution with respect to two crucial macroeconomic prices. The interest rate and the exchange rate. So it is crucial that the interest rate be lower than the average rate of return to a business. And uh, to guarantee that the interest rate be lower than the average rate of return to a business, 
uh, to entrepreneurial activity, it may not be enough to radicalize competition in the formal financial sector, breaking up the bank oligopolies. It may be necessary to take more radical measures. For example, in most countries in the world, it is actually illegal to lend for a physical person to lend money to another person for interest uh, under the usury laws or under the laws of financial regulation. But we may need to change that and allow uh, individuals to lend their own money to other individuals for entrepreneurship with minimal regulatory constraints at their own risk as a way radically to democratize the creation of credit and of money. Now, the second crucial macroeconomic price is the exchange rate. And countries that are rich in natural resources, like Brazil, are especially vulnerable to the so-called Dutch disease, in which the production and export of commodities results in an appreciation of the currency that is subversive of uh, innovative activity in the domestic economy. And again, there are practical devices to take as antidotes to this Dutch disease, to the appreciation of the currency. For example, that, uh, the, the, that the export of commodities be taxed inversely to the aggregation of value. So, so, in other words, the less value is aggregated to the commodities, the higher the tax on the exports. Now, uh, we have to be careful in, in our thinking about these two macroeconomic prices. It's not as if a lower interest rate and a depreciated currency in and of themselves generated economic growth. It's, it's rather the opposite. It's negatively that a, an interest rate that is higher than the average rate of return to a business and an appreciated currency can negate uh, a, a structural program of economic growth. So we have to be sure that the economy is not under the incubus of these destructive forces. But we can't expect these two prices in and of themselves to generate the positive effect that we desire. Now, the third element uh, in this alternative program is then the breakthrough of constraints on the supply side of the economy. As I suggested in my Brazilian fable, it's never enough to deal just with the demand side if we don't have a project on the supply side. And a characteristic mistake of the progressives in the contemporary world has been to abandon the supply side to conservatives. The general objective on the supply side is to bring the economy as close as possible to the frontier of the most advanced contemporary practice of production. So today, in the world, that is what we described as the knowledge economy. And thus, this, this effort converges with what we earlier studied as the advancement of an inclusive form of the knowledge economy. All of the institutional arrangements that would broaden access and coordinate access to the key resources of credit of technology, of advanced practice, of advanced knowledge. And investment by the state in the key multi-sectoral technologies. The counterpart to, the, to these supply side efforts is the concern to prevent the price of labor from being depressed and labor from being disorganized and thrown into conditions of precarious employment. Thus, the importance of the development of a legal regime that protects, represents, and organizes 
otherwise precarious labor. The fourth element in this alternative is a project on the demand side of the economy. Having a project on the supply side does not exempt us from having a project on the demand side. But on the demand side, what matters most are the institutional arrangements that influence the primary distribution of economic advantage, of stakes and assets, and of capabilities and opportunities. Rather than just the corrective redistribution of economic advantage through tax and transfer. And with respect to the corrective redistribution, what matters most is not the progressive profile of the tax system on the revenue raising side, but the aggregate level of the tax tank that can be sustained in the initial stages by heavy reliance on the indirect and neutral taxation of consumption. Uh, now I come to the, uh, to the fifth element in this alternative. The fifth element is educational revolution. So this is a great project of national liberation. And a project that should not be seen as merely technical, that should be seen as central to the, to the future of the country. And it has two, two dimensions. Uh, one dimension is its institutional and financial contact in countries that are large, unequal, and federal in structure or otherwise decentralized. A series of measures designed to reconcile local management of the schools with national standards of investment and quality. And then the second aspect is the actual pedagogic model, the, the, the way of teaching and learning, which, as I argued before, should have the following attributes. It should, be, it should prioritize analytic and synthetic capabilities rather than the mastery of information. With respect to information, it should prefer selective deepening to encyclopedic coverage. In its social setting, it should be cooperative rather than tolerate the juxtaposition of authoritarianism and individualism in the classroom. And in, it, in its approach to the received body of knowledge, it should be dialectical, uh, presenting every discipline from opposing points of view. And this model should be applied to vocational or technical teaching, which should focus on generic capabilities rather than job-specific and machine-specific skills, as well as to general education. The, the threshold obstacle in the advancement of such a project is the formation in the country of a pedagogic vanguard. Thousands of teachers who are the co-authors as well as the implementers of this alternative. Now, the sixth element in this alternative is the development of a state, of the state apparatus. Uh, as the counterpart to what will be the seventh element, which is the deepening of democracy. So a radicalized, a deepened democracy requires a capable professional state as its instrument. And there are three agendas for the construction of the state that in many countries, such as Brazil, must be pursued simultaneously, although step by step. There is a 19th century agenda of the formation of state careers, professional bureaucratic uh, apparatus that has never been fully implemented in many countries. Then there's a 20th century agenda of administrative efficiency to be judged from outside the state as well as from inside the state, and that cannot be understood as simply the mechanical transposition of entrepreneurial efficiency to public administration. And then there's a 21st century agenda of experimentalism in the activity of the state. For example, take the crucial area of the provision of public services. The state should furnish 
a universal floor, a universal minimum of services to all the citizens. And the state should also operate at the ceiling in the development and financing of the most costly and complex services. But in the broad middle area between the ceiling and the floor, the state should uh, call independent civil society, prepare it, finance it, monitor it, so that through cooperatives of different forms, civil society participate together with the state in partnership with the state in the competitive and experimental provision of public services as the best way to enhance their quality and to provoke the self-organization of civil society outside the state. Now we come to the seventh and most difficult element of this alternative, and that's the organization of politics. And the concept of a, a deep end or high energy democracy. So what we now have in the world as the available political background to these development projects uh, is the choice between weak, low-energy democracies, like the democracies established in the North Atlantic world, and authoritarian regimes, more or less Caesaristic in their character. So uh, a, uh, a low-energy democracy is a democracy that first maintains the population at a low level of engagement in political life. Second, perpetuates impact between the parts of the state. For example, in the Madisonian scheme of checks and balances. And third, uh, depresses the, the possibility of a particular part of the country of seceding from the national solutions and creating counter models of the national future at the same time that it inhibits strong central initiative. The consequence of these institutional arrangements is twofold. On the one side, to make change depend on crisis in the double form of economic ruin or military conflict. And on the other hand, to make the state porous to capture by powerful, organized interests in society. Uh, so that's what I'm calling weak democracy. So, uh, on the other hand, we have the authoritarian regimes, uh, which could be seen as attempts to cut the Gordian knot of impasse, by fiat. But they have three crucial frailties. The first is that they make the cause of national development hostage to the interest of the authoritarian vanguard in maintaining its own power. The second is that they unavoidably create a setting for the conversion of political power into economic privilege and then of economic privilege back into political power. And the third and most fundamental objection is that they forfeit the basic advantage of democracy, which is an epistemological advantage, the advantage of discovery, of discovering and of creating national alternatives, rather than having imposed them by dogma, by dogmas associated with the self-interest of an authoritarian elite. So what is the solution, given that we're faced with this choice between weak democracy and authoritarian regimes? The solution is to take the weak democracies as a starting point and to create a dynamic of the deepening of democracy. The deepening of democracy along three main dimensions. The first dimension is the raising of the level of organized popular engagement in political life. So 
as it were, to metaphorically, the raising of the temperature of politics. We should not have to choose between a politics that is cold and institutional and a politics that is hot and extra or anti-institutional. We should be able to have a politics that is at once institutional <coughs> and hot. Through innovation in the electoral regimes, through the financing of political activity, the public financing of political activity, and through the uh, broadened access to the means of mass communication in favor of the organized social movements as well as the political parties. The second set of innovations are innovations designed to hasten the pace of politics through the rapid resolution of impasse. So take the Latin American situation that I uh, mentioned in my Brazilian fable. Uh, the advantage of the presidential regime in a very unequal society in which the political parties are beholden to privileged interests is that it allows for a direct march to the center of power and the election of a president with a strong plebiscitarian mandate. But the disadvantage is that it was designed to inhibit the transformative uses of politics. So in this historical period, we would maintain the presidential regime, but equip it with devices for the rapid resolution of impact. For example, either political branch, in the face of an impasse, would have the constitutional prerogative of calling early elections. But the exercise of this constitutional prerogative would always require the initiating power to pay the political price of running the electoral risk. In other words, the election would always have to be bilateral for both political branches, even though the, the, the constitutional prerogative were, was exercised at the beginning by only one branch. And by this simple device, we would transform the Madisonian scheme into a machine for the acceleration of politics. So we can maintain the liberal principle of the fragmentation of power, many different sources of initiative within the state, but repudiate the conservative principle of the slowing down of politics. The third set of innovations has to do with the relation between the center and the periphery in the organization of the state. Conservative political science and statecraft imagine mistakenly that there is an inverse relation between power to the center and power to the periphery. In fact, we can design the state so as to enhance <laughs> the possibility of strong initiative, but at the same time allow parts of the federation to deviate from the national solutions and create counter models of the national future. Society goes down a certain path, but as it goes down a certain path, it hedges its bets, allowing parts of itself to create a different version of the national future. We can imagine two stages in this evolution. In the first stage, we uh, facilitate cooperative federalism. Cooperation in the federation is the main uh, instrument of experimentalism, vertical cooperation among the three levels of the federation and horizontal cooperation among the states or among the municipalities. And in the second stage, we become more radical and we imagine a situation in which the right of deviation need not be uniform. Particular parts of the country can apply under certain conditions for the right to secede from the national solution and create counter models. And the, the grant of this right would have to be vetted by the political branches of government and by the judicial authorities to be sure they were not used to entrench the advantages of one group or class against others. And the great benefit is the benefit of experimenting with alternative versions of the national future. So the, uh, the, the idea that I want to defend is that uh, we don't have to choose between weak democracy and Caesarism or authoritarian regimes. We can, we can reject this choice 
and we can move in the direction of a high energy democracy. A high energy democracy is a democracy that weakens the dependence of change on crisis and that creates a state that is less susceptible to being captured by the, by the moneyed and privileged interests in society. Uh, now I, uh, I conclude my, my argument with uh, a suggestion of three ways of thinking about this alternative. So in one sense, what this alternative does is to exploit the affinities among ex experimentalism in the domain of the economy, in the domain of education, and in the domain of politics. So the underlying motivation is this. Like the liberals and socialists of the 19th century, we recognize the need for structural alternatives. But unlike them, we can no longer bring ourselves to believe in the, in the adequacy of some definitive institutional blueprint. Uh, and therefore, we need institutions that among their attributes have the crucial attribute of corrigibility, that they allow themselves to be corrected in the light of experience. And that is what these proposals design in these different domains of social life. Uh, now, uh, uh, a second way of thinking about the different parts of this alternative and what unifies the different parts is that they all have to do with a central value or, or goal, and that is the enhancement of agency, of individual agency and of collective agency, our capacity to act, our capacity to turn the tables on the organized structure of social life. And the enhancement of agency is more important than the achievement of any discrete goal. And that uh, reflection in turn leads me to a third way of thinking about what unifies the different parts of this program. Uh, and I want to explain it by, by reference to the troubling problem presented by contemporary nationalism. Now we know nationalism is often the background to Caesarism and to the Caesaristic forms of populism. Uh, contemporary nationalism has a peculiar and misunderstood character. Uh, and that is its abstract quality. So, for collective identities in the past to, to be, to share in the collective identity, for example, to be a Roman, an ancient Roman, was to live according to the customs of the ancient Romans. But that is not the character of the contemporary nationalist. In the contemporary world, uh, all the states in the world come to the altar of uh, worldwide emulation, economic emulation, ideological emulation, and they tear out parts of themselves they are willing to sacrifice part of their traditional way of life for the sake of worldly power. So the collective identities are eviscerated. And the nations of the world become more alike one another. But the more they become more alike, the more they want to be different. Two nations live side by side, and they hate each other. Not because they are different, but because they are becoming alike and because they want to be different. This is the peculiar character of contemporary nationalism. The, the peculiar character of contemporary nationalism is that it is the expression of an intransigent will to difference that is all the more intransigent because it is empty of tangible context. An abstracted 
eviscerated collective identity, because it is abstract, cannot be the object of compromise. There's nothing to compromise. Now, there are then two responses to this situation. One response is the, the, the response of liberal cosmopolitanism, which wants simply to suppress the will to national difference. And the other response is the response implicit in the program that I just outlined. That the way to make the will to difference fertile, to, to, to expunge from the serpent the, the venomous sting, is to equip the will to difference with the institutional and educational instruments for the creation of real difference. Not the differences that have been inherited but the differences that can be created in the future. And that is another way of understanding the spirit of the program that I have just outlined. Now, uh, I presented this project all at once in all of its parts, and it can then be misunderstood as a kind of system, which it is not, uh, as a, a very tall mountain to climb. Uh, when, in fact, in our practical engagements, we have to explain it and implement it step by step and piece by piece, not as a system. Uh, when we consider this daunting task, we may have reason to take Mark Twain's advice to heart. The truth is so precious that it should be revealed only little by little. I think we should open uh, for questions and discussion on, 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 on this, but I just want to start yes. by um, asking you to, um, to connect where you ended with um, where you started, which was the Brazilian story. Yeah. So to, 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 you said that um, the seven-part program that you've outlined is not a system uh, in the sense that you just you know, don't necessarily have to um, do all of these things at once. At once. Um, and um, I don't know exactly what you meant, but you don't by saying you don't even have to reveal it all. Um, and, and so hide the, in some sense, hide the, the true nature of the program uh, um, from whom? From the people? Uh, but that's a side issue. Um, but the real question I want to ask is, what does that um, uh, more gradualistic, uh, less systemic transformation look like? For example, in Brazil, uh, there's an election coming up. Um, let's suppose uh, your preferred candidate wins. Uh, what would that actually look like in a concrete way? Well, I think, I think that there are... So uh, this is a subject which we, we discuss in other contexts. So, and first let me make a methodological clarification again. So in an academic setting like this one, when we, when we deal with alternatives, it's natural to privilege the intermediate positions of a trajectory of change. In other words, neither very close to what exists today, nor very far from what exists. Because the intermediate positions are the ones that are most revealing of the conceptual structure. They have this scholastic character. But there's a problem with them politically, which is that they're likely to be too, too far away from what exists to seem immediately feasible, but not far away enough from what exists to arouse enthusiasm. And therefore, in the practical discourse of politics, we spur in this intermediate level, and we combine the very close with the very far away. And so the language of transformative politics is at once practical and prophetic. So it's not, so this discourse that I just had in the classroom is not the discourse of a real political arena, because it's, it's, it's correcting, and you in your own minds have to adjust for this and imagine how it could be carried forward at many different levels, from, from the proximate to the remote. Uh, so I, 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 I think that for each of these seven elements that I mentioned, 
there are equivalents in the immediate experience of Brazil or any other society. So you take, for example, the, um, uh, the advances on the supply side of the economy. The main agent in the Brazilian economy is a multitude of small and medium-sized firms. Uh, the vast majority of them are pressed back to a technological and organizational rear guard. And in particular, the Brazilian economy lacks an agent that performs a crucial function in many economies, which is the mid-sized vanguard firm. Uh, but on the other hand, the Brazilian state has a whole series of instruments which would be very useful for an operation of uplift. Uh, there's an agricultural agency which transformed Brazilian agriculture, opened up the, the subtropical savanna and turned it into one of the main agricultural frontiers in the world. Uh, there's an entity that uh, assists small business on the consulting side which is actually the most difficult part of the uh, transformation of small business. Uh, there are public banks whose loan portfolios can be redirected and so forth. What there is not is a, is a plan that coordinates these different forms of action and enlists them in the service of this structural transformation and then relates that to the way in which the Brazilian economy fits into the world economy. So similarly, on the educational side, uh, Brazil is a country in which now there are a multitude of uh, remarkable educational experiments, often in very remote parts of the country. And, uh, uh, and in which the national curriculum that has just been proposed falls far short of the level of these advanced experiments in different parts of the country. So the raw material is there. But the main raw material in the country, in Brazil, as in the United States, the main raw material is this anarchic and overwhelming vitality that exists in the country. That's the main point. So, and that vitality is today incarnate in this new social agent of the, what I call this entrepreneurial petty bourgeoisie and the multitude of, of of still poor workers who have converted to their mentality behind them. So that's all the basis. So if you ask, what is the actual social basis for this alternative, it, you can describe it in two ways. Uh, on the one hand, it is an alliance of producers and workers against rentiers, the main beneficiaries of the existing model of the rentiers. Huh? On the other hand, it is a project for this crucial agent in Brazilian society that is now bereft of a political project. This, this mass of the emergent uh, who have counterparts in all of these middle income countries in the world. That is, if you look around the world now, objectively, structurally, there are more petty bourgeois than there are industrial proletarians in the Marxist sense. So the, the, and if the criterion is subjective rather than objective, that is the horizon of consciousness, it's the overwhelming majority of humanity, which by default has petty bourgeois aspirations. So the question is whether we can meet them on their own terms and present them with a broader menu of institutional possibilities and forms of action. And that's what this kind of project is designed to do. So uh, the, the, the fundamental tragedy in these societies, and this is true of the United States as much as it is true of Brazil, the fundamental tragedy is that the, the, the whole society is this vast seething cauldron of human energy, of aspiration, of dynamism. And the, the preponderance of this energy is wasted for lack of instruments and of opportunities. And that's the tragedy that has to be addressed by these institutional interventions. It seems to me that, that there is one central uh, uh, economic 
uh, challenge. I'm not going to call it contradiction, but there's one central economic challenge in the in the program uh, that 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 you've laid out. Uh, that does require us to think about this program not only in a system as a system, but also in a system that can provide a very compelling narrative uh, to the public and achieve a very significant transformation in the ideological mindset of a, of a lot of people. So yes. In that sense, I think the story doesn't have to be partial, but has to be actually not only fully laid up, but done in a very convincing way. It has to be a narrative. And, 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 and let me explain. Uh, what that challenge is. I think it goes back uh, fundamentally to the first two elements of the agenda, which is uh, the fiscal shield and uh, your, you know, your two macroeconomic prices, a low interest rate and a, and a competitive currency. Uh, now, on their own, uh, the instruments that are going to achieve that, uh, which is to create a very large uh, fiscal surplus, increase public saving, uh, increase taxation, um, uh, pursue the kind of capital account controls that would ensure that the currency remains uh, depreciated, that prevents capital uh, outflow, um, and therefore the interest rates do not rise. Uh, all of that are almost certainly uh, going to be extremely contractionary uh, when they are implemented. And if they are implemented in the early stages of the program to create that shield, means that in the very early stages of the program, you have a hugely contractionary stimulus uh, that's coming out uh, from the effect of these. What do I mean by contraction? Uh, essentially, um, a very significant reduction in overall spending, uh, spearheaded first by the public sector, because in order to raise the public saving, of course, the public sector has to cut um, uh, its um, uh, its, its expenditures um, uh, and and the rise in, in taxa taxation, consumer taxation, of course, at least on impact, is going to have very large uh, negative impact on, on, on private expenditures. Now, on top, all the sur supporting things you need to do, like capital controls, again, on their own, are likely to undermine business confidence uh, uh, to a significant extent. So put all of that together. I think you have in the short run a very large. Uh, but just a question of business confidence. Uh, Doesn't let me the come back yeah. to that. So, the, so, the, so the, taken on their own, uh, these measures uh, are essentially very contractionary. So you're facing a situation that any new administration that's going to try to implement something like this is facing a very large uh, uh, reduction uh, in economic activity, the threat of increased unemployment, layoffs, and so forth. So, uh, what could what would counteract that, in principle, I think what would counteract that is the other side of this narrative, that what we are engaged in uh, is, is a longer term program that actually is really, that is going to uh, um, uh, you know, sort of significantly transform the supply side of the economy, uh, uh, connect the vanguard to the rear guard, uh, change the nature of politics, uh, revolutionize the way that we're uh, carrying out our educational policies. So that's sort of the rest of the narrative, and that has to be, in some sense, so convincing and compelling uh, that uh, effectively, you know, people buy into this narrative and say, our, our, our future is so bright uh, that we should spend nonetheless. Um, that uh, that you're, 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 you know, you're, you're making people and, you know, sort of small businesses, medium businesses, entrepreneurs are so optimistic about the future of the country uh, that they understand, fully internalize how this is going to be something that uh, they really want to be part of and therefore they want to spend and invest from the early time on. So that seems to be sort of, you know, economically, it seems to me that that hinges very much on this uh, kind of a narrative being very compelling while at the same time, uh, I think, you know, a lot of the, you know, the the appeal of the story intellectually is also that what you, know, you called at the end a uh, desire to create um, uh, corrigible institutions. Uh, and, 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 and inherent in this notion is that we actually don't know what the hell we're doing, um, that we're going to find out a lot along the way, and that these mistakes are going to be corrected. Um, and, um, and, and so I don't know how to sell this story. Um, I don't know how that there are political elites or political groups that, uh, that, that might be able to sell that story. 
uh, maybe the part that you meant that when you said that you don't want to tell the full truth is that you don't want to share the truth that we don't know what the hell we'll be doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, that you know, the corrigibility of the institutions that, um, uh, uh, that is critical intellectually as, as, the, as part of the appeal to this is not necessarily shared with the public, but yet certainly that's going to be one important part of the criticism that you'll face from the intelligentsia. Correct. And, 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 and those you know, economists who've been you know, sort of badly educated in, in, at Harvard and, and so forth. So, mm -hmm. so, I, so it, it's, um, um, so convince me otherwise. Well, I'm not sure that I should convince you otherwise. So it's, it's, so it, in the application of this story to Brazil, right, because my seven-point program was not specifically about Brazil, right? It, so it was about the broad <coughs> range of these middle-income countries. Uh, in, in the application of the program to Brazil, there are a, a host of details, of quantitative details that would be crucial to the appreciation of your very important point. So, for example, a major part of the Brazilian budget is uh, servicing of the internal public debt at, uh, at, at an interest rate that really has no counterpart in the world for its longevity. Uh, there's, it, it's unrivaled. Uh? And there's a debate in Brazil about why we're paying this interest rate for the internal debt. Some of the bankers themselves profess perplexity. Uh, so it seems not to be some autonomous market phenomenon, but at least in part the result of some compromise with these plutocratic interests in the country. So we, 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 have, we have to open the hood and deal with these detailed technical aspects. The same thing with the pension system. So there's an elite of public functionaries that has the lion's share of the pension payments in comparison to the rest of the country. So um, there, are, there are many aspects of the, of, of the, the budgetary commitments of the Virginia state that are the result of this weakening of the state and its cannibalization by these private interests. So the deprivatization of the Brazilian state, so to speak, then creates the basis for a transformation of the budgetary pact. Now, how, how far that goes depends on detail. So that's part of the answer. And then the other part of the answer has to do with, with dosage, right? Because it's, it's the direction. Now, you said at a moment in your comments that this would, that there are aspects of this program that would offend business confidence. But there are other aspects that converge entirely with the project of fiscal realism urged by the orthodox economists, although for other reasons, right? So uh, the, 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 the first point of the fiscal shield is biting the bullet of fiscal realism and not accepting that there's some way of circumventing the imperative of fiscal realism. So there's no way out of that. And uh, now, a mistake that's made in these debates in Brazil and all around the world is that the imperative of fiscal realism is sometimes treated as if it were an accounting preliminary to a strategy of national development that would be developed later. But it's not an accounting for the moment. It's, it's a major resettlement of the social interest. It imposes, as you say, significant social sacrifice. And the country will only accept the sacrifice. The sacrifice is seen in place in the context of a project that is broadly democratizing of, of opportunities. So those are all partial responses to your question, but I agree with you that this is this is a central problem. That any alternative would have to face in Brazil. Not just the alternative that I use. So let, let me let me then uh, turn a little bit more to the to the broader political uh, yes. parts uh, of the program because I, I do want to discuss with you a little bit this this notion of high energy 
democracy and all of that. And, and, and to do that, let me tell uh, my Turkish faith. Yes. Um, and uh, about it, you know, um, because I, I think to some extent where we've come to these issues depends on, on, on our experience, or on, on, on where we actually come from. Yes. Um, and, and, and about a 15, you know, 15 years ago, there's a new uh, government that comes in, in Turkey, uh, with a, an overall story um, that is uh, very much um, one of, of uh, popularizing and deepening democracy. Um, the, uh, the background uh, is that Turkey um, uh, uh, has long been, was long run by a, a kind of uh, a, a, a secular or a secularist uh, elite uh, that viewed themselves as uh, uh, the um, holders, upholders of the Kemalist tradition uh, of uh, westernization, modernization, secularization. Um, an, elite, an elite that essentially held the highest echelons of power uh, in the judiciary, in the educational, in, in the bureaucracy, and the military, and that few, viewed themselves as essentially the guardians of the republic's Kemalist mm -hmm. values. Um, and, and the central uh, division and cleavage in society that had been created uh, by the um, long-running rule of this elite um, was a, the kind of conservative... Muslim conservative heartland in the country, largely in the countryside, but um, also to a large extent organized because of uh, uh, large um, numbers of rural urban migration, of uh, sort of you know middle, lower middle class uh, people who felt uh, that they were estranged, that didn't have enough voice in the regime, that their values were um, uh, um, uh, 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 essentially not taken into account. Um, and that they, they have been largely left out of the networks of privilege uh, which the Kemalis elite had shared with sort of modernizing um, industrialists in the, in, in the large urban parts of the country. Um, and uh, this new regime that came in under, uh, 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 under Erdogan uh, essentially underwent, you know, it did a lot of what it promised in terms of reaching out to that secluded heartland or excluded heartland uh, spoke with its with its language and with its uh, uh, values, seemed to uh, be uh, be um, essentially uh, indeed deepening democracy and, and 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 running against many of the taboos of the Kemalist Republic in terms of uh, uh, you know um, uh, creating apparently a, you know greater sort of uh, you know sort of you know permitting greater degree of expression of certain cultural rights and religious rights. Uh, which opened up the system uh, um, to this, uh, to this uh, conservative heartland, uh, started talking to the Kurdish nationalists, um, violating another taboo of the, of the Kemalists. Um, and, and all of this process looked like uh, at least you know, some of the elements of uh, a, a broadening, deepening democracy was taking place. Uh, the, the regime also promised a new economic model that would be much more open uh, and not, not limited to provide benefits to the uh, old industrial elites. Uh, and indeed, uh, there was you know, sort of much talk of uh, so-called um, Anatolian Tigers, uh, business, uh, businesses in the regions, in the country, in sort of more uh, in, the, uh, in the central and, and eastern parts of the country. Uh, as a counterweight to uh, is the, the, the business uh, plays um, uh, uh, that have grown up uh, out of industry, out of Istanbul. Um, and, and, and this changing nature of the economy and changing nature of politics and apparent broadening and deepening of democracy, in fact, didn't even need uh, the kind of shield um, that, uh, uh, that your story described to the extent that um, it, it was very much approved both by the sort of the Western intelligentsia, both at home and uh, in the West, and didn't need a shield against capital flight because uh, the narrative one was one that um, that uh, um, that a lot of um, observers felt that this is exactly moving the dem democracy in, in the right kind of, of way. Now um, the now we know that that. The story of what was happening in Turkey was, in fact, uh, even from its very the early days, was a very misleading story that one didn't need to scratch very deep uh, 
uh, behind what was going on uh, to see that, in fact, uh, what was being created was uh, a system that would uh, essentially entrench the autocracy of a relatively narrow group of people around Erdogan. Um, and that um, uh, what, um, uh, you know, sort of, you know, this, this, that this, this narrative was a very, very false one. Um, now, I don't need to sort of check, you know, sort of sketch out everything that has happened since then, all the erosion of even the relatively, the relatively limited norms of democracy and civil rights that existed before Erdogan entrenched uh, his power. Uh, but we know that this, the, the story has not turned out quite well, uh, most certainly in the political dimension. Um, and even though I think on the economic front, the shoe hasn't dropped uh, fully yet, uh, uh, it will eventually. Um, so we have essentially um, a, a kind of a, a, a disaster that's still uh, in the making. Now the point of bringing this out is, is to sort of say that if you look at this experience, from the vantage point of where I basically left it, which is around 2006-2007, when sort of, you know, the, the hype about the Turkish story um, uh, was still prevailed, um, there, there was in what, um, you know, one, uh, what an economist would call an observational equivalence uh, between a regime that seemed to be transforming in the way that um, uh, you, know, you or I might have approved um, uh, and, uh, in other words, a, a country that seemed to be led by a leader with a transformative vision uh, that was intent on uh, achieving much greater inclusion in the social and political dimension. I, I didn't talk about all the social experiments in terms of broadening access to health, education, and housing, in which uh, he also engaged in. Um, uh, there was a sort of, you know, very um, uh, uh, a form of, of, of observational equivalence between a regime that was in fact making a transformation in a direction uh, that we would have found very hopeful and, and approved of, uh, and a regime that was essentially becoming an autocracy. Yes. Um, and that observational equivalence arises from the fact that the path, the paths to both kinds of regimes go through a process of weakening the hold on power of the pre-existing elites. Uh, so when you're attacking the pre-existing elites, uh, you know, it looks, it could be either because you're doing that because you want to take their place, or because you really want to build a transformed regime where, you know, sort of everybody has access and it's, it's, a, it's a deeper democracy. And so that, that kind of, of uh, you know, transformational, equi uh, observational equivalence in the transition, uh, I think raises a very deep question to an observer, and also a deep question analytically, uh, about sort of how do we know it's one and not the other. So one very big question in, all, in, in this is, is exactly, you know, how would we discriminate between a path uh, that is a path towards Caesarism, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to a path that's uh, sort of a high energy uh, democracy yeah. where it's sort of, you know. Uh, so that's a big question that, that, that to my mind, uh, I, I think uh, is, uh, is, is, a, is a broad question that, that your account raises. Now, I think to many of us, uh, and, and certainly to me, sort of having gone through that experience, it's, it's, it's very appealing, appealing then to kind of take refuge in a certain kind of, of you know, affinity towards you know, the, the kind of uh, the, the, the uh, features of the Madisonian democracy, which you denigrated. Uh, but if you come from an experience like that, uh, it is very yes. appealing. Uh, that an affinity towards uh, very you know, sort of cautious politics, affinity towards agencies of restraint that actually limit what executives uh, can do, uh, an affinity towards um, you know, gradualism uh, rather than sort of, you know, big plans, and a skepticism towards large-scale transformatory uh, um, uh, agendas, certainly uh, an aversion to big ideas um, uh, because those entail eventually big changes. Um, uh, and, and yes, indeed, you know, so an affinity with you know, sort of the discipline of thought that comes with neoclassical economics uh, as well. So uh, you know, you're telling us to you know throw caution in the wind, and and you know I'm sort of saying, well, you know that has a down, very huge downside too, 
uh, when we face fundamentally this, uh, this, uh, you know, this, this observational equivalence uh, in, during the periods of, of, of transition, that, that we, it's not always easy to tell whether you're facing uh, a, you know, Caesarism in the making uh, or you're facing you know, deeply transfer, you know, a, 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 a genuine structural transformation uh, in the direction that, that uh, we both would, would, would approve of. Now, the, you know, maybe even the broader point is that, that, that I worry that there is a central contradiction that, you know, that you're, trying, you're, you're explicitly trying to evade, yet I'm not convinced we can evade, uh, between you know, a state uh, that might be too, um, too weak to undertake the full-scale educational um, and um, uh, e economic transformation that we want, because that requires a, st a state that is indeed very strong and professionalized and so forth, and yet at the same time is, is too strong uh, uh, to protect the rights of, of, of individuals and to provide uh, the kind of accountability uh, that we would like a state to see, uh, to, to, to have. Now, I, I'm not sure that, that, that the mechanisms that you've, you've highlighted um, specifically in your, in, 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 in your, in your, uh, in your comments uh, you know, go to the heart of that, that contradiction that, that are mm -hmm. sufficiently comforting to uh, those of us, you know, sort of like me, who think that that's a very central contradiction that is particularly salient, in fact, in these middle-income countries. Uh, you know, that, that at least from this vantage point of the advanced countries, uh, those countries do have much longer traditions of liberal democracy, uh, of provision of, 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 of civil rights and separation of powers. Uh, first, we'll see whether, in fact, you know, those traditions will help countries like the United States, given the kind of, of, of the, the, the attacks of Trumpism uh, and, and the like. Uh, but in the case of middle-income countries, we're, in fact, talking about countries that don't have those traditions, or not necessarily don't have those liberal traditions. Uh, and traditions of, of, of uh, separation of, of, of powers um, don't come through a kind of mass industrialization experience that have created an industrial working class and the you know sort of the you know, the cementing of the franchise and, and political rights um, uh, and, and uh, various elements of social democracy <laughs> that that has created. So it seems to me that in many ways, in fact, the, the, this conflict between a state that's on the one hand, you know too weak to achieve economic and social transformation, but too strong uh, to repress, uh, not to repress the rights, uh, is, you know, that conflict is accentuated in these kinds of countries. And, and, and in that way, it may be that those countries are not, you know, the, the best uh, place to engage in the kind of, of experiment um, that, that, that you've laid out. And that would be my my skepticism on that. So, so, so let me say first, I'm not throwing caution to the winds, but I don't believe that it is cautious to acquiesce in the established institutional arrangements. So there are three aspects of your Turkish story that draw my attention. And the common element is the presence or absence of institutional change. So the first has to do with the organization of the state and the politics. Uh, so the most common thing in the so-called third world is the coexistence of conventional liberal constitutional arrangements with Caesarism. So it's precisely this oscillation between the stagnant, limiting, paralyzing constitutional arrangements and they're being overwhelmed by Caesarism or cannibalized by Caesarism, as opposed to a, a, a constitutional reconstruction. And the folk, and one of the focal points of the constitutional reconstruction has to do with an ambiguity in the concept of separation of powers. So separation of powers can mean two different things. One thing is the existence of a plurality of centers of power in the state that are independent of one another. Nothing in what I propose is against that. The, I want not only to maintain that, but to enhance that. So 
for example. In Brazil now, the judiciary and the public attorneys have very widespread powers, extraordinary powers. And that's an example of the proliferation of powers in the state. Uh, nothing that I'm proposing is against that. I want a fragmentation of powers in the state. But separation of powers means something else, which is when there is an impasse between the branches of government, is the impasse de deliberately perpetuated or is it resolved? Uh, is, is the objective to overcome the impasse, for example, by early elections or by programmatic plebiscites or to maintain it? So I don't want separation of powers in that second sense as deliberate impasse. I want it in the first sense. And in that first sense, it is compatible, not just with the proliferation of powers in the state, but with the enhancement of the immunities and endowments of the individual. So this is a very general theme in programmatic discussions. For example, you take the, the debate in European social democracy about the minimum guaranteed income. So the idea, or flex security, as in Scandinavia, the individual should be secure in a haven of vital protected interests so that he can then tolerate innovation all around him. The problem in the conventional discourse is that there's a story about the security, but there isn't the story about the storm, about the plasticity, which would be the counterpart of the security. So we, we give more protection to the individual, but then we throw social life open to experimentation. Those are not the opposites. Those are the counterparts of each other. And when we prevent this experimentation, and when we render the state incapable of decisive action, we create the setting for Caesarism. Because Caesarism is then the cutting of the Gordian knot and reacting to the paralysis of the state. So that's the first element in your story on which I want to fix. Let me, let me yes. follow up quickly on that. So uh, let's assume that separation of powers or fragmentation of powers is something that, as you say, is desirable, but doesn't necessarily have to come in the form uh, that we observe it uh, currently. In the form so, of the deliberate, deliberate programming of deadlock. Right. So, but the, I mean, in, in practical terms, the question is. How do we get you know, the desirable kind of fragmentation and not the undesirable? So you suggested, for example, that you could um, have um, uh, you know, both um, the, you know, the executive uh, and the legislative branches of the governments uh, be able to call for simultaneous elections. Yes. Uh, the election. Now that's something that already happens. In, you know, in principle, is possible in parliamentary systems. Yes, yes. Um, and I, I, I'm not sure that that overcomes the problem. Uh, it, it doesn't overcome the problem all by itself because, I mean, for example, you take the French, the constitution of the French Fifth Republic, there's a slow time and a fast time depending on whether the parliamentary majority coincides with the president. And I'm describing a constitutional system that has only a first time. But actually there are three, there are three elements in this story and all of them are necessary. So one element are the constitutional mechanisms for the rapid resolution of impasse. The second element is the deepening of the immunities, the safeguards of the individual, legal and economic, so that the individual is free in the midst of conflict. And the third element is the increase of the level of organized popular engagement in political life. Because the real security in politics against Caesarism is that the population not be passive, but be active and organized. Yeah, I, see, I, I, mean, I see that point, but again, we, we, we return back to you know, what divides us, which is that, so, so every time there's either practical objection, you know, your response is that but, you know, this is not on its own what's required. There's two other things that have to yeah. go through at the same time. And then, then, I, then I criticize your approach by saying, you know, Everything has to be in place for the whole system. That there's all this deep, this deep complementarity. There is a complementarity. <laughs> and then you say, but no, I'm not, you know, it's, this is not a system. So you can. It's not a system in the sense that it happens all at once. That's true. That's true. Uh, but, but so this is a, a change, a, a cumulative change in the character of politics. But if, if that's the method of change, that's always been the method of change. That's how structural change has always happened. 
It's always happened in that way. So in the creation of these democracies, that I'm calling the weak democracies, they also depend on this complementarity. And there are several elements also arose in this complex process of combined and uneven development. Now, let, let me just mention the two other elements in your story that, that, that drew my attention. So the second element is the fate of the petty bourgeoisie, of this lower middle class or of the poor working class majority with a petty bourgeois horizon. So by default, they then uh, commit themselves to the traditional economic device of isolated retrograde family business and have an affinity to xenophobic nationalism. And the, it's a faithful question in these societies is the extent to which this crucial group in society can be brought over to a different experience and a different set of aspirations. And that's not just a question of consciousness, that's also a question, this, a question of the menu of the economic alternatives that are available to them, alternatives to the traditional form of isolated family business. Now then the third element in your story, which seems to me to, be, to have a crucial importance, is the failure of the Kemalist Republican force in Turkish society to reinvent itself and to seduce the heartland. So this was a political failure, a failure of imagination. So they didn't have a strategy, a discourse, a, a, a project that could fight it out with, uh, with, with the force that became ascendant for this crucial element in Turkish society. And Without that element, you can't understand what happened in Turkey, I'm, I'm thinking, even on, on the elements of your own story. And so they, they would have to have a different economic program and a constitutional program that would offer an alternative to that heartland of Turkish society, which is related to the second element in the story. I mean, in their mind, they did. It's just that it didn't work. I mean, in their mind, they did have a narrative. It was that you know, Turkey was going to be a modern, Western, secular nation that uh, you know that would avail itself of all the benefits of modern technology of the science. European Union with the uh, same institutions and so forth. Exactly. Well, that's that's so. If that was their imagination, that's what I'm calling lack of imagination. You know? <laughs> that's that's the. So, so I, I don't, I, I don't yeah, disagree, yeah, yeah. but, it, but in their, it's not that in their minds they did not offer a different and... No, uh, I understand, I understand, but, but it doesn't count as what I would call a, 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 a reinvention that could meet the historical challenge. But let's, let's yeah. bring up some, some, some comments from you. Yes. I mean, I think about the reinvention part of the Kemalist vision, thinking about how Kemalism started as like the, from the ashes of Ottoman Empire, basically. It was loud, um, yes, loud. Like, thinking about how Kemalism was born out of the ashes of Ottoman Empire. It was a huge reinvention and like a whole new yeah. vision for society. But I think overall in the last decade, they just didn't, not last decade, last century, they didn't have sort of a... Um, incentive to uh, change their values and change their story and change their narrative because they had like the secular power and they had the like the people the elite supporting them essentially and i think the whole election in 2002 was not anticipated by anyone and once they took the power like the current government people um, like i don't now i think like there has to be a new story as well and now the current government is suffering from the same problem basically if that makes sense well, I think that's I think it's a good, very good point that, that, as you say, coming out of the Ottoman Empire, I mean, it was from the... It was a radical from, reinvention it was, it was, the earlier was, it was a radical. Yeah. It, was, it was a radical leap uh, of yeah. faith that something like this would be possible in, in Anatolia. Um, and uh, in a self-consciously uh, reduced geographical space, because in, in some ways, you know, the big leap you know, the big jump in imagination that, uh, that Kem the Kemalists did was not just to uh, picture themselves as, as Europeans, uh, but also do it in the geographically constrained space of Anatolia, uh, 
uh, that, that, that explicitly given up uh, territories in, in, in the Balkans and, and elsewhere. So, um, so yes, and I, but I think, I, I think, as you say, you know, the, the, the lack of imagination here was, and the part that I agree with you, was, was the lack of, of reinvention, lack of, of yes. changing to circumstances. So they would have had to have done, done the same thing again, twice, right? At, at least. I mean, yeah. I think what, what happened with the Kemalist um, vision was that it, over, it became an overly defensive one. Uh, that uh, over time gave up, you know, much of the appeal of becoming Western in the sense that it gave up many of the liberal norms, uh, in part because it was, you know, always uh, fighting the demons of the past, including the the, uh, the the threat of a slippery slope towards religious fundamentalism, which kept the regime, uh, you know, essentially authoritarian uh, by depriving this conservative heartland of many of the rights that uh, a truly liberal regime would have provided in terms of freedom to worship, freedom you know, to wear whatever you want. And then so they, you know, they, they allowed something like the headscarf, headscarf or the uh, prohibition on wearing a headscarf in public space uh, as uh, you know, to become a, a symbol uh, for the opposition, uh, which was a very silly thing to do, but it was driven by this notion of the, slip, the defensive slippery slope that you know we allow uh, conservative people um, to wear headscarf while you know they're teacher or while they're judge uh, uh, in a public space. Uh, then the next thing we have is you know secularism is undermined by people you know you know sort of willing to um, to have a religious uh, uh, regime. Um, and the other thing, of course, was this notion of, again, a very defensive notion of, of nationalism, which deprived uh, Kurds of many of their cultural rights. Um, and so the, the Kurds' demands for cultural rights you know, became kind of slippery slope for ethnic separatism. That yeah. They give them their cultural yeah. rights. Um, uh, and any kind of, of local autonomy would, event, would eventually uh, be followed up by demands for separatism. And, and therefore, you have to stop. The so that that made that makes the regime highly illiberal, um, and I think that was sort of the um, uh, the failures of the old regime. Um, um, so, but you can move beyond these you know, specific cases of Brazil and Turkey in the last uh, few minutes. Yeah. Uh, no, I would like to talk about Brazil. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. As a way of talking about the world. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but uh, I think uh, uh, talking about Brazil, we can talk about the challenges of the developing countries uh, as well. I don't want to be a banker, uh, and uh, I'm not doing my PhD on economics here. Uh, on the contrary, uh, I, I came from a huge experience in the government that you call here of uh, a government that made the popularization of consumption uh, and increases uh, of income of the working class. Yeah. However, Professor, uh, I would like to uh, uh, ask you just to hit a little bit the, the debate between, between us and with the, the class. Uh, this kind of uh, uh, vision uh, are a kind of conservative vision of the social democratic governments in Brazil in other parts of the world that in your books you absolutely destroy and call conservative, call uh, and uh, with uh, other kinds of terms. I'm talking uh, about this because uh, I think that when you are in the government, in the real government, not to the imagine uh, how you, you govern the country, uh, you, you have to choose and you have to decide uh, about the conflicts, uh, of the, the daily conflicts, and in uh, decided about this kind of conflict, uh, this uh, movement that uh, this part that uh, push your institutional imagination to solve this kind of conflict, and uh, I think that the social democratic experience in Europe, in Brazil, in other parts of the world, uh, uh, brought a lot of uh, good institutional uh, innovations in the work that we are seeing right now. In Brazil, for example, our program of cash transfer program that people now now no, call a kind of uh, World Bank cash transfer program had nothing to do with the World Bank traditional cash, pro uh, cash transfer program at the beginning. 
the, in fact, it was uh, absolutely the opposite. The other strategy and uh, uh, in the experience, in the ex experimentalism of the government, it became a, a, a big cash mm -hmm. uh, 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 problem. The other example that I would like to mention is uh, uh, in Norway, for example, the sovereign f fund. When the social democrats and uh, uh, the right wing uh, in Norway dispute the vision of the sovereign uh, fund, there is no uh, a vision uh, about what the, this kind of fund will create in the future in the world. For example, change the uh, uh, corporate governance, uh, uh, the corporate governance <coughs> in hedge funds, because the Norways, uh, uh, the Norways, I decided that they don't want to invest in this kind of in, in some kinds of companies. And so, what what was my problem with this uh, this set of uh, vision here? Is that uh, you are uh, putting too much strength in a vision uh, that we have to imagine up front, and you are so so critical with the, the real people that you are fighting uh, the big disputes in the society uh, right now. Uh, and I would like to uh, hear more about that uh, of you because sometimes I think as a social democrat, as a moderate leftist. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I was calling here of vulgar Keynesian, uh, conservative, uh, and uh, all sorts of uh, uh, things. It's a technical term. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I know it's my birthday today, so I uh, suggest uh, uh, be kind with me. <laughs> Well, uh, so, so, let, so let me just say in general uh, that I think the greatest historical achievement of social democracy throughout the world has been a high level of investment in people and in their capability. And within the limitations of Brazil, that's also true of Brazil. It's not just true of the Europeans. It's just not enough. We have another problem now. We have, this was my main point in the Brazilian fable. The, the comparatively easy part was the part, was the part about the demand side of the economy, financed by, by nature, by commodities. The much harder part has to do with the supply side, with production, with education, uh, with the structure of things. That's a higher order of ambition. And that gets us to the problem that Danny Roderick brought up about how we can deal with things that are combined without dealing with them as if they were a system. Now, there's an aspect of this discussion that I wouldn't want you to understate as you, as you think about this, and which puzzles me extremely. And that's the aspect of ideas. So you mentioned it as some a priori doctrines. It's not about that. We, we can't change the world unless we have ideas. Huh? And so I am, I'm shocked by the situation. Uh, in the world. Put aside Brazil. Now, take China. China is the most successful of these large developing countries. Uh, I just had an experience of several days of debate in the Central Party School in Beijing of the Communist Party and in the State Council. I'm shocked by the level of the debate because the, 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 the conceptual structure of the debate is all this secondhand American social science, economics, and policy discourse with a distant genuflection to Marxism that plays no functional role in the discourse. Meanwhile, the, the, the country is rife with this multitude of micro-experiments that these conventional ideas that they've imported from the United States throw no light on. So if, if for, for the country to have a strong national project, for it to understand itself, for it to understand its own possibilities, it has to develop an independent intellectual life. It has to have ideas. It's not a blueprint, but it's the imagination of directions. It's an ability to imagine structural change. That, to, to my mind, is the heart of the discussion that we're having here this, this semester. And uh, without that, the, 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 the enormous vitality, which is the, the, the precious resource of these countries is squandered. Uh, the, the, the object in, in progressive politics is not to humanize society. The object is to divinize humanity. It's to make us bigger. It's to have a shared bigness. And for that, we need ideas, ideas that we don't have. 
and that we're not going to get from Harvard University. <laughs> yes, we're having yes. this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we'll have to say more about uh, uh, social democracy in the future yeah. next yeah. week, which is yeah. uh, precisely on that.